Coming up, total solar eclipse. I live in Little Rock, Arkansas. I heard that it's one of the best places to see the solar eclipse this year. Can you tell me more about it? Thank you. I love NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. We have everything you need to know about the upcoming event. Also, fond farewell after weeks of rehab. These two seal pups are back in the wild. We're at the Jersey Shore with details. Then meet Seldovia, the story behind this otter's name, plus Taylor time. Our Kids Edition correspondent has the very latest on Taylor Swift, from her new album to those friendship bracelets. I love to make friendship bracelets. I know many Swifties do too. Fans make them and then swap them at her concert. Where did the idea come from? The idea came from one of her songs, You're On Your Own Kid, where in the bridge she references make the friendship bracelets. And what it's become is this huge community builder for Swifties. And spreading kindness. We'll introduce you to this young woman who wants to inspire kids and lift their spirits. And it all started with one handwritten note. I really saw firsthand how difficult it is to be a kid in the hospital. And I really wanted to be able to do something to help other kids who were going through the same thing that I was. And I also saw how impactful receiving a card can be. This is NBC Nightly News, Kids Edition. Welcome back, everyone, to Nightly News Kids Edition. I'm Lester Holt. Always great to be with you. Hope you're having a terrific week. We've got a terrific lineup ahead, including our pop quiz. The subject this week, geography. But let's begin with a question that's been on many of our viewers' minds lately, and that's the upcoming total solar eclipse. It's set to take place on April 8th here in North America, and astronomers say the event promises to be both thrilling and extraordinary. It's a cosmic dance that will leave some of us in parts of the United States totally in the dark. The moon literally about to steal the spotlight. A total solar eclipse will cross North America on April 8th, passing over Mexico, the United States, and Canada. Cities like Dallas, Little Rock, Indianapolis, and Buffalo will be in what is called the path of totality. Hi, my name is Jason. I live in Little Rock, Arkansas. I heard that it's one of the best places to see the solar eclipse this year. Can you tell me more about it? Thank you. I love NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. I have a question for you. How does the solar eclipse happen? Great questions. A total solar eclipse happens when the moon passes between the sun and earth, completely blocking the face of the sun. To find out more, my pal Al Roker and I went straight to the source. Hayden Planetarium Director and Astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. So Earth and the Moon always have a shadow in mm -hmm. space. Right. Always. All, all the time. But Earth's orbit around the Earth is not always lined up with the Sun. Okay. It's tipped. So here's the shadow. It misses the Earth. Sure. Every now and then, every couple of years, somewhere on Earth, the shadow will come right onto Earth's surface. Right here. To help demonstrate, I grab a flashlight and play the role of the sun. Yeah, I'm the, the sun. Image, the moon is lit up on the other side. Uh -huh. From Earth, you can't even see the moon because it's lit on the other side. Uh -huh. But you can see the sun, and the, as the moon orbits the Earth, Boom. it blocks the sunlight. That's so right. Only one area will have total blackness. One area, and, and that area of blackness is a circle, and it moves across Earth's surface. So that's why the eclipse has a beginning and an end. Mm -hmm. so now, is it going to get dark, dark, dark I mean, like, like dark, night, nighttime? Dark. When this covers it, when it's it's night, the stars come out, the planets are in view, animals start behaving weirdly. What's the difference between a solar and lunar eclipse? We've had uh, other questions from viewers. A really good one is about what's the difference between a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse? Yeah, since both the moon and the Earth always have shadows in space because the sun is always out there. The shadow, if it's just there. So in a solar eclipse, the moon passes between the sun and the earth, casting its shadow on the earth. In a lunar eclipse, the moon passes into earth's shadow in space ah. and disappears into the umbra, the darkest part of the shadow. 
These are, for my money, these are much less spectacular because the moon just kind of disappears and then kind of reappears. And as it disappears, it looks like it's just going through its phases. It and plus, and plus, the whole thing takes three hours. And here's an interesting fact, for every solar eclipse, on either side of it, there's also a lunar eclipse. It's like a sense. twin brother. It's a twin yeah. brother, they happen together, yes. Huh. Yeah, you don't get one without the other. Pretty cool. The total solar eclipse on April 8th is expected to last about four minutes. It will start with the sun getting skinnier and skinnier, and then the sun will become a crescent. But as the sun gets narrower and narrower, the shadows start getting sharp. And there are these mottled light that come through the trees, through the leaves, and we just think that's light. The tree is acting like a pinhole camera, and those are mini images of the sun. Wow. Mini images, so that when the sun goes to crescents, every one of those little blocks of light becomes a little crescent. And you have your protective eyewear on sure. because you can't look at the sun. Once the moon completely blocks the sun, you can take off the glasses and bask in the majesty of the solar corona. We can't normally see the corona, the outermost part of the sun's atmosphere, because the sun's surface below it is so much brighter. But during a total solar eclipse, the corona becomes visible. We are here with our class at Hillsborough Middle School in New Jersey. We want to know why we can't look at the sun during an eclipse. Hi, my name is Agania, and I have a question. Why do we need special glasses to see solar eclipse in, in the day? Bye. I like my Nini's Kids Edition. So we've had questions from kids wondering about how safe it is to look up at the sun during this eclipse. Yeah, so you should never look at the sun without protection. It would actually harm your eyes. Yeah, it would harm your eyes, that's right, because your lens of your eye focuses whatever is out there. And if it's a very bright source of light, it can then damage your retina. Remember, do not look directly at the sun without eye protection. So we have special glasses for this. So once you each have one, okay? If we look at each other through these right now, you don't see anything. Yeah. Okay? Right. Yeah, it's completely yeah. dark. Yep. Yet, if, you, if the sun were up and you look up, you'd be able to see the sun. Mm -hmm. so, so this is not some version of sunglasses. Right. These are very specially designed. Yeah. NASA says solar viewing glasses should comply with the International Standards Organization, or ISO. And you want to make sure I see it meets the requirements for ISO certification. It'll be stamped to that as these are. April 8th will be the last total solar eclipse visible from the United States until 2044. Mm -hmm. Dallas, one of, one of the cities that's going over, Indianapolis. If you look at that path, it's come, some of the major cities in North America are gonna be in totality on April 8th, that afternoon. And you add up the total population, it might be one of the most viewed eclipses in the history of the world, simply because of how many big cities it crosses. People wanna be together. To they wanna be it. together and share a cosmic phenomenon together. For more on those special glasses you'll need to wear when looking at the sun and viewing the eclipse, our friend Andrew Fazakis from National Geographic has everything you need to know. This is probably the most magical of all sky celestial events that you, you can encounter in your life. To see this safely, however, this is what we call the partial phase of the solar eclipse, you need to have uh, special protective eyewear, these uh, solar eclipse glasses like the one I have here. And these are being uh, given out available in many places across the country and places like libraries and schools are giving out these special eclipse glasses. They're outfitted with a very special film called Mylar film that blocks out 99.999% of the solar rays, making it very safe to see the sun through these glasses. But those of us that are going to be lucky enough to be in the path of totality, where the entire disk of the sun does eventually get hidden by the moon, that phase, by the way, called totality, at that point, you can take these glasses off and view the, the eclipse safely. That's because the entire disk of the sun is covered by the moon. So you can't see the sun anymore, but once totality ends, when a little bit of the sun starts creeping up and starting to get brighter again, that's when you put these glasses on again and you watch 
uh, the, the, the second half of the partial eclipse of the sun. If you don't happen to have glasses handy, there is another way you can watch the uh, eclipse safely, and that's called the projection method. You take a piece of cardboard and you punch a hole in it. And then you take another piece of cardboard and you let the light from the sun go through that little hole in the first cardboard piece and hits that piece, that light hits the uh, the second cardboard and you'll see that shape of the crescent shape of the sun as it's going through the uh, the partial uh, solar eclipse. It's really fun. If that doesn't work and you have trees in your backyard or front yard somewhere, look on the ground during the partial phase of the eclipse. You'll see hundreds and hundreds of little images of of the crescent sun projected onto the ground underneath a tree uh, and and it's absolutely spectacular folks can take a picture of uh the total solar eclipse very easily if you have access to one of these solar eclipse glasses you can put your smartphone lens right up to one of these mylar filters and you could snap uh, pictures, just be patient. And of course, focusing, is it can be a challenge, but it's a lot of fun. It makes for a great keepsake. It's something that you wanna share with your friends and family, and it's something that you will never forget for your entire life. All right, meantime, a very special farewell took place this week in New Jersey. Two gray seal pups who were rescued were released back into the ocean. Our friend Emily Aketa has the heartwarming story. They're already starting to undulate towards the ocean. It was a big day this week for this SEAL team. The second one just got in as well. Both of the SEALs are in. Two gray SEAL pups in Brigantine, New Jersey, were released back into the ocean after weeks of rehabilitation. Their journey along the Jersey Shore began in February when they were rescued by staff at the Marine Mammal Stranding Center. Number 11, as he's identified by staff, was found just miles away near the dunes in Brigantine Beach. We came across this little fluffy white gray seal. The seal's body still covered in his white birth coat. They usually keep it till they're weaned. That's usually about two to three weeks. Just hours later, the center received an urgent call about another gray seal pup. She was reported to have something around her neck. From what we can tell, it's the plastic overwrap from the case of bottled water. Number 12 was only about a month old and was likely making her way down from northern New England and Canada, where many gray seals are born. As for that piece of plastic. She managed to get it off in the, in the crate on the transport back. She's very feisty. Once they arrived at the center, number 11 and 12 became the newest in-house patients, joining more than a dozen other SEALs on site. We treat this facility very much like you treat a human hospital. With no major medical issues, the rehab process for both pups was all about packing on the pounds and getting them to eat on their own, something that went swimmingly, especially for number 11. He likes to sing for his supper. Uh, he's very vocal about what what he wants. Since arriving at MMSC, 11 and 12 have already doubled in size, now weighing about 80 pounds each, allowing them to graduate from their smaller pens to the big pool. The big pool gives them an opportunity to start practicing their diving endurance again, getting them diving deeper and holding their breath. It gets them swimming a lot more. And after nearly seven weeks of care with a tender touch, this adorable duo was ready to dive back in. We're hopeful that they'll head out, find their own way, find some food, and continue to do well. It's just such a great feeling to watch them go. Emily, thanks so much. And speaking of sea creatures, let's head to Chicago now for our picture of the week. This sea otter pup at Shedd Aquarium was just named. So say hello to Seldovia. The rescued otter pup is named after where he was found, Seldovia, Alaska. Shedd Aquarium says the Seldovia Village Tribe is grateful to have worked in conjunction with the aquarium to give him a meaningful name. The name Seldovia was chosen by the children of Seldovia, Alaska, reflecting their connection to and appreciation of nature. Seldovia is now nearly six months old and we're told he's doing well with early training that encourages important behaviors like diving, foraging, and grooming. What a terrific name. Okay, time for our pop quiz. The question this week, the Appalachian Trail starts in Maine. In what state does it end? A, California, B, Georgia, or C, Virginia? 
I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Okay, time's up. The answer is B, Georgia. The Appalachian Trail stretches more than 2,100 miles and traverses through 14 states from Maine to Georgia. The public trail was built by private citizens and completed in 1937. Well, turning now to entertainment, superstar Taylor Swift is taking a break in between her era's tour stops as fans eagerly await the release of her new album next month. Our Kids Edition correspondent Ella caught up with Taylor Swift reporter Brian West for all the very latest. Hi, Brian. I'm Ella, and I'm eight years old. Thanks for joining us. I have a few questions for you. Hi Ella, I'm so excited. I hear you're the biggest Taylor Swift fan. Taylor Swift has a new album coming out. What can you tell us about it? So what we know is there's four different versions to this. So the base of the album is 16 songs, but on the four different versions, you have different bonus tracks. So there's the Bolter, the Manuscript, the Albatross, and the Black Dog. It's coming out on April 19th, which as you know, Ella, Taylor always is very intentional about the day she releases her albums. That day in particular is the day that in 1775 was the American Revolution. So there might be a tie. One of the songs is So Long London with kind of Great Britain and also America, but oh. it should be super exciting. I know fans are really excited to hear some of her new music. I love to make friendship bracelets. I know many Swifties do too. Fans make them and then swap them at her concert. Where did the idea come from? The idea came from one of her songs, You're On Your Own Kid, where in the bridge she references make the friendship bracelets. And what it's become is this huge community builder for Swifties. So no matter which concert venue you go to, you can expect that there are people with carabiners or bags and bags of friendship bracelets. It's a really good icebreaker really good way for you know fans to interact. I was also really fortunate that you were here with your mom, Jessica, in Nashville, where I work, and you gave me a long live friendship bracelet because you asked me one of my favorite eras and songs, and that's my second favorite song of all time. And I have it at my desk. I'm so grateful for it. So that means we are officially friends, and I gave you a friendship bracelet. Why do you think friendship bracelets became popular? I think it's definitely with because of Taylor Swift. So she has what's called, you know, the Midas touch, the golden touch. Everything that Taylor Swift does turns to gold. So when she said like, make the friendship bracelets and it started to become a thing at her concerts, it just took off and became really popular. One more question. What is the most unique or memorable bracelet that you have seen? So I have so many, but I'm gonna have to go with just one that really means a lot to me is the one I talked about that you gave me. I'm so grateful that because of Taylor Swift and Jason Kelsey, I was able to report on a video of you waving to Taylor and then you were able to come meet me when you were here for a dance competition in Nashville. And so that's a really memorable moment that we will always have. And look, you're holding, what are you holding? Your bracelet. Oh, see, you have it. Thanks. <laughs> of course. Thank you so much, Ella. You're so good at this. And I love your t-shirt. Show me your t-shirt. You're in your reporting era. Here we go. <laughs> I have all of my bracelets. Those are so good. You're really good at this. I'm so grateful. Thank you, Ella. Thank you. Okay, Ella, thanks very much. So great to have you on Nightly News Kids Edition. Well, finally, in our inspiring kids series this week, an update on a story we brought to you last year about one young woman who is paying it forward and spreading kindness and positivity to kids who are in the hospital. Let's get details now from our friend Ava Maldonado. Jen Rubino spent her childhood in and out of hospitals undergoing nearly two dozen surgeries for a childhood connective tissue and bone disease. You feel isolated, you feel away from, you know, basically school, friends, life outside the hospital, all of that. It's really difficult and it's, it's hard to go through that at any age, but especially when you're a kid. After one especially difficult surgery, Jen received something that would change her life. A handmade card 
It was just made by a hospital volunteer. She dropped it off while I was sleeping. So it was someone that I didn't even know personally, but even so it still had an amazing impact, you know, during such a difficult time, just knowing that someone took the time to wish me well and encourage me, it really made such a difference for me. And so I knew that I wanted to be able to do that for other kids. It's such a small thing, but it really does make a difference. Jen's own experience inspired her to start an organization, Cards for Hospitalized Kids, a nonprofit that distributes uplifting handmade cards to children in hospitals. I really saw firsthand how difficult it is to be a kid in the hospital, and I really wanted to be able to do something to help other kids who were going through the same thing that I was. And I also saw how impactful receiving a card can be. What started out as a small effort in Illinois grew into something big. To date, the organization has distributed over 500,000 cards, both in the U.S. and around the world. We have a lot of people abroad who make cards for us. It's people of all ages and walks of life. You don't have to be super talented artistically. It's something anyone can do. And kids across the country are feeling the impact, like this family from South Dakota. I'm Stacy Madsen, um, and this is Camden Madsen, my son. We are from South Dakota. Camden is eight years old and just recently had a heart transplant in Chicago. So we spent from February until October in Chicago for his recovery. When Camden was in recovery, he received a card. It was just kind of like a nice surprise and to see that there's other people out there that care and you know are hoping that you're doing well and it just really kind of boosted his spirits and he loved getting mail in general so when he would get these cards like it was just really like exciting um, to see you know what what they were and who they were from one day camden hopes to pay it forward he really likes to draw and he likes art and just being creative I think once he's getting to feeling a little bit better, we might try and get into making some cards for the, the program so we can send cards out too to other kids. Meanwhile, for the last 12 years, Lurie Children's Hospital, the place where Jen was a patient, has received thousands of cards. Lurie Children's was the first hospital that Cards for Hospitalized Kids uh, sent cards to patients and we have since received over 10,500 cards that we've distributed to our patients and families. And because she was treated at Lurie Children's, she thought the best way to start distributing the cards was at the hospital that she had received her care. Those notes go a long way for kids who are sick and struggling. The cards really bring hope, comfort, and encouragement to our patients and families when it's least expected but needed the most. Uh, the cards, you know, are often distributed during a long chemo treatment where parents and families and the small kids are there for hours upon hours for full days, you know, receiving their infusion or, you know, long hospital stays where the days kind of get monotonous and, and the cards bring that sense of, you know, inspiration and joy that families need at the most critical times. Ava, thanks so much. What a great story. Well, that's going to do it for us parents. Just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. Thanks for watching, everyone. Remember to take care of yourself and each other. So long.